this could be fun. <laughs> I've known Matt for a long time, and um, it, it, you sit there during cocktail time, and he really gives me a hard time. Um, I pretty much agree with everything Matt actually said, for the most part, um, especially counting the five um, on questions and answers. And quite frankly, to take that checklist that he gave you and sit down with any one of you should you have your deposition taken and, and give you the exact same, you know, tell the truth, think about your answer, don't speculate, stick to the facts. Those are the kinds of things that we would prep the witness for as well. It just, and the, and the, the other one was common sense. So. Anyway, uh, but that's not to say that I won't have some fun in the long way anyway. So I thought it was interesting that your communications guy basically insulted just about everybody on the panel. <laughs> so uh, just, I just noted that. So, uh, <laughs> so um, uh, first of all, again, I want to thank as well um, uh, State Lands Commission for the opportunity to, to be here and to, to network with you folks these ideas. Special shout out to my friend uh, Dennis Vogel, who's uh, really one of the architects of this thing. It's put this thing together. And it's really, it really has become a marquee event, not just in California, but I think recognized uh, in, in, the, in the industry generally. So the people who travel far and near. So thanks for that. And then uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for um, those, especially those of you who were out with me late last night and are others carrying on. Uh, I know that uh, that morning don't came pretty early. It's pretty impressive to see everybody here. My voice is about two octaves lower than it was <laughs> yesterday. <clears throat> it has nothing to do with the uh, alcohol that managed to cross my lips, I'm sure. <laughs> and then one last quick thanks to my colleague, Destiny Finnett, who took the labor and work, quite frankly, put this presentation together for me. It's really, um, uh, you know, a neat thing to have somebody work with you, put things together. And I guess they had Matt Drennan help me out with that. And today it's uh, Destiny, so it's nice to have a team backing you up. A um, couple other quick little disclaimers, if I can. Um, there appears to be some sort of bug in the, in the system. I swear I didn't do it, and it's not a cyber uh, attack on the system, per se. <laughs> anyway. So I'm not, um, if I can just, just a show of hands real quick. Uh, who here um, has a Facebook page? You just raise your hand if you have a Facebook page. So just, okay, now, of, the, of you who have it, how many of you use it really just to monitor what your kids are doing? Okay, that's an honest answer there. So, I, and how many don't have a Facebook page? I want that. Oh, yeah, about half. All right. Well, I'm, I'm kind of a paper and pencil guy. I'm still learning how to use this kind of stuff. It wasn't for Destiny, Matt, and Josh, and other people. I don't know that I'd be able to do it quite that way. But um, my good friend Bob suggested to me that I get a Facebook page and start to get uh, a little more involved in the technology and the cyber component, especially since I'm going to be talking about cybersecurity and I should know what people are, are doing. And I just wasn't really ready to do it. I was a little afraid. I always hear stories about people doing it. So, so I told Bob, well, I'll give it a try, but I'm going to do it kind of the analog way. So yesterday, in preparation for today, I walked around and um, you know I was telling people what I had for breakfast and where I went on vacation. I showed them a few pictures of things I had. If I saw somebody, I would give them two thumbs up like this and I would tell them I would like them. You know, I was trying to do it kind of outside of the Facebook realm, do it kind of the old fashioned way, you know. And by the end of the evening, I had four people follow me two cops, a psychiatrist, and an investigator. <laughs> I'm on a roll. All right, let's get on with that. Let's get on with the cybersecurity component of this. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, that in this presentation, and with the time we have left, that I can talk about the types of disruptions that I think we're all vulnerable to, we, the industry. It's not just pipelines, it's terminals, it's facilities, it's ships, it's um, the power grid generally. Um, and talk a little bit about some of the risks and liabilities that, that lay there and how the standard of care has started to evolve and what we're starting to see in other areas, whether it be healthcare or whether it be in the retail side, and how those concepts may be borrowed and, and imposed over to, to what you good folks do. And then I want to talk a little bit about some of the insurance implications, because a lot of folks need to think that insurance will cover it all. There's some, there's some things there that are starting to develop that I think are interesting, that may be of interest to you uh, the way you conduct your business. I am not an expert on SCADA. Uh, I'm not an expert on industrial control systems. I know you folks are. We talk about pressure gradients and differentials and stuff like that. So let me, let me just say a couple things about the technology as I understand it to be. When SCADA and, and these other industrial control systems, and those of you who are like me, these are, these are basically that take the, the digitization or information and turn it into some sort of analog or mechanical means to open the valve, shut the valve, to read pressures, to read temperatures, to, to see what's going on in the system. We heard from uh, Dave a little while ago that it was uh, uh, controlled in Midland, Texas uh, on, on the pipeline that was going on in California. When these things first started, we weren't a Windows-based uh, uh, entity or, or society. 
I think the email was around at the time. So these things have been around for years and years, decades, and they were built to last for decades. And it was, we're talking about this orange and the green CRT, you know, a, a tube kind of stuff, right? You remember those, some of you? And so, so as, as technology came in, we had these isolated systems. They're very proprietary in nature. Shell had one, Exxon had one, similar to it. We would buy them from different vendors, but they were proprietary in nature, and they were isolated. They were kind of off the main grid, off the main internet of things, if you will, at the time. Again, they were built uh, in, in, a, in a system where it was germane to that one particular system. You wouldn't have been able to control something from Midland, Texas, and California, you know, when these things first came out. But as time went on, and as we all got a little more sophisticated, and we started using uh, Windows-based as opposed to uh, uh, iOS-based uh, uh, operations in, in industry, we started training our, our folks and we started bringing that kind of technology into the control room and into the operations and we're able to make those interfaces. So as we've started to connect and make things more convenient, and as we started to take those systems and update them, upgrade them to a Windows-based or a, a more PC-friendly uh, environment um, to do the same functions, we open ourselves up to the vulnerabilities that everybody else has as well. So it's not that it's not that you guys are necessarily um, isolated in that respect, but you, you have had a great isolation system that has now migrated into a more readily available, more connected kind of a thing, and that's the vulnerability that I think um, I think we have. So you know, you have this great technology that's designed to make things more efficient, more convenient, more accurate. You know, being able to shut things down quicker, but at the same time, we kind of open ourselves up to this vulnerability. So there's two types of cyber uh, 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 threats, I think, to uh, industrial control services. One are malicious. These are, the, these are the people that sit back and try to think of ways to disrupt. They may want to steal data. It's intentional. And there are different types of, you know, if you want to get into the weeds, there's different types. There's this advanced persistent attack, which takes a little bit of time, takes people, it has a lot of human interface, people think this through. Um, and they're trying to figure out a way to either disrupt your operation, to steal something from you. Um, and, and, and it may lay dormant for a long time. It may be a phased in kind of approach. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, so that you guys did. Um, so it's advanced because it's, it's people who really were trying to get into something, to do something maliciously. Uh, and it, they usually have very little tricks. They either, they either can you know, wipe themselves off the system if they're detected. They can remain undetected for long periods of time. They can be executable down the road. They can do those types of things. And it's really hard to figure out where they are, when they're there, and that type of thing. So that's that's the that's the crook, that's the villain, um, and we're all, you know, scared straight about those kinds of things. But there's really only so much we can we here in this room can do. We we rely on technology and people to help us out. That the other one are the accidental introductions of malware and and things in your system. We call this a self-inflicted wound, right? I mean, it's like basically pulling the gun, your head pulling the trigger. And there's a whole various ways that we can see how that works out. Laptops, thumb drives. Uh, wireless, uh, uh, you know, phishing scams, things that get planned on the system, where with a little bit of, of uh, uh, cyber hygiene, you know, reminding people, yeah, it's not okay to email you something from the office to your home because it'll be easier to work on. Use the Citrix system or use use the system that your, your firewalls are, that your company put in place. Now, we've all done it. We all do it. I, I think some of us walked up in here, and I know I did, and gave, you know, state lands a, a thumb drive to load these, these presentations on. So. Thumb drives actually aren't as big of a problem as people think, but they can do. They can have malicious stuff on it. So when you give it to someone, you take it back, you've got to get it sterilized again before you can use the same stick. So a broad range of targets. We see, uh, you know, uh, folks in all kinds of industry uh, get hit. We've seen uh, Target has been hit through an HVAC, which is basically a, a contractor uh, for heating, uh, ventilation, air conditioning. Uh, we're doing some monitoring, and then some hackers broke into that contractor and then got into, into uh, retail and consumer information as well. Um, Pizza has had a problem, Home Depot's had a problem. We all heard about Sony. Uh, it, it, it got whacked pretty hard by the uh, North Koreans. Uh, financial institutions, I mean, just this last week, I guess it was, not too long ago, uh, Yahoo finally admitted that they've gotten hacked too. They have 500 million people using I didn't know Yahoo still had that many users, actually. But uh, in any event, um, uh, they, got, they got hit as well, and, and that was part of the issue. So, um, heavy industry's been hit. Um, you know, we've got some large industrial plants, uh, power, uh, power plants, and other things that have also been hit from time to time. Public utilities are at risk as well. And we all heard about the story about the airplane, where they happened to be uh, a little bit of a spoof, but somebody basically said he was watching the entertainment system and was able to hack into the cockpit, scare the heck out of everybody, but I think it turned out to be a false, uh, false claim on his part. So let's talk a little about specific case, uh, case studies where the pipeline industry uh, example has been hit. I'm going to say this one time. 
the Baku Tbilisi, no, I can't even say it. Baku Tbilisi. Tbilisi Seon, VTC pipeline. Pipeline was supposed to be one of the most secure pipelines in the world. You know, over a thousand, uh, almost uh, over a thousand miles of, uh, of uh, pipeline with all kinds of sensors, valves, cameras, most sophisticated secure system uh, in, 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 uh, in, 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 at the time, at least uh, in, in service. And, um, and in 2008, they had a problem with it and had a, an incident, obviously an explosion. And at the time, they thought it was a malfunction. And it wasn't until 2014 that it was actually determined to have been the attack of, uh, you know, the result of the cyber attack to the system itself. What they found was, oddly enough, uh, the hackers actually entered the system through the, through, through the surveillance cameras. They found a hole in surveillance cameras and were able to worm their way into the system and started messing with controls, building up pressure. So this, this happened in 2008, but it wasn't a number of years later that they figured out exactly what had happened. So, it kind of goes back, it kind of go back and rewrite history a little bit. This was probably um, a good example for two reasons. One, it can be done. And two, it can be done, you may not even know about it until much later, if ever. So sometimes, you know, it, it, it's a watershed moment, I think, that those folks who are in the, in the pipeline or in the uh, cyber security area, this is kind of a watershed moment to say back, wait a minute, that thing happened a little bit, a little bit later on. And like the Titanic, right, it's unsinkable. You know, this was supposed to be one of the most secure pipelines uh, ever. Then there's the Stutniks um, deal. Now, this one kind of, you know, I don't want to get too political here, but this one gets mixed with a little bit of emotion because this was our government doing this high Iran. And, you know, for those of us who want to get one up on somebody once in a while, we did it. But then you think of the implications. Maybe we threw one of the first stones. Okay, so what we ended up doing was we ended up putting some malware, a two-part two attack. It was brilliant, actually. Uh, put some malware on some thumb drives. We got those into, into the, uh, the, the nuclear uh, facility that was being developed at the time. And we recorded normal operations, all right? Just what, what, is nor what do normal conditions look like, right? Just like you see in the movies, you know, the bank heist, they, they, they take the video the surveillance camera and they dupe it in, they got 20 seconds to run, run through and the security guard's looking at the camera and there's nothing happening in there, that type of thing. So that's what we did. We basically went and we, we recorded what the, what the uh, uh, system looked like and then, we, and then we came in later, put that video back up for the operator to see it and then we sent uh, some controls through the Siemens, uh, uh, the German engineering firm, uh, into the centrifuges and sped them up so they actually damaged themselves and set, and then set the nuclear program back uh, some time. And we, we denied it, of course, and I suspect that you know, anybody who works for the government is supposed to still deny it, but um, yeah, it was kind of cool actually, but kind of scary if you think we can do it and come back the other in the same way. There's a, a couple of other incidents, oh, again, in the industry, in industry, we had a malware attack in uh, 2012 at Targ Island in Iran, um, and then uh, the was there, I won't spend a lot of time talking about the, the Ukrainian power one was one that was made the news, obviously, in 2015. They haven't really figured out who did it, but the company, the country who suspected it the initials is Russia. And uh, so the, the, at least the Ukrainians like to blame everything on for Russia, so that's where, uh, that's where it's going. And you guys have heard, you know, all the complaint, all the complaints about the Russians and the North Koreans kind of taking wax at different times, different, different runs of different systems. Talk a little bit about uh, some uh, So the U.S. is uh, is really no different. I mean, uh, this is actually <laughs> coincidentally, Dave. This is a good chart. Uh, yesterday, for those of you who sat on uh, Dave's uh, uh, presentation, he actually gave that, that that slide. But this basically shows the intricacy and the vast number of, of systems that we have. These are all interconnected, just like up in. The refugio, you know, you've got Exxon, Veneco, all these other folks relying on certain pipelines and certain facilities uh, coming out. We have the same kind of systems throughout the U.S. Um, I know that uh, some folks in the room here are involved in the, uh, the colonial pipeline uh, situation on the East Coast. And that's, that's having a huge financial impact uh, on, on the price of gasoline and whatnot, the lease that they have there. But it really affects a lot of different operations as well. So you can imagine the vulnerability that we would have or the, the implications that would, would be caused should there be a successful attack or, or a, 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 a bad day because somebody had bad cyber hygiene and it, it caused a self-inflicted wound. Now, um, the, the, uh, let's see, here. one thing I wanted to mention to you, there's been no successful attacks yet on U.S. Um, pipeline systems. There have been several attempts uh, that have been recorded, but there's actually been no, no known uh, actual events. And, uh, the chairman of the House Committee at Homeland Security for, uh, um, uh, on cyber, the Cyber Security Committee basically said that cyber attacks are the biggest threat to the nation's pipeline system. I mean, so the government's acknowledged this. This is where we are. It's a huge, huge deal. 
So it's not you know, anti-corrosion or product protection issues. It's not operator error as most accidents are. The biggest threat right now to pipelines is not the normal stuff that we deal with. It's now becoming or has become, at least in the government's view, uh, a cyber threat. And that's, that's, that's significant because we are all on notice that our industry is under attack or, or is vulnerable. So for those of you who had the pain of sitting in my presentation yesterday about being a responsible corporate officer, you now are on notice that there is something that you might be vulnerable to if you are in a position of authority or responsibility. Do you have a personal obligation to make sure that your organization or your entity are taking steps or have taken steps to mitigate and reduce those risks? We talked a little bit about points of entry. I won't spend uh, too much time with that. I think you, 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 uh, you can do it. What I didn't know before, and Destiny uh, actually educated me on this one, was a water blank. Basically, you basically uh, put malware, you put some sort of a, a bad uh, viruses at a particular place where you know people will go. And when they go there, like a watering hole, they go there, they then get contaminated and they take it back to their systems. So um, I can't give you an example because I can't think of one, but it makes sense to me. Because you, we all know about the other ones, phishing and, and all these uh, spam emails and everything else we're supposed to stay away from. So we need to start looking perhaps at cybersecurity as a safety issue. And if we do that, we can see where the implications would be. There's risks of uh, 